Why don't you stand with me this morning? Because we do serve a God who is mighty in deed and word and power, who does not lack in ability to impact our life and change our life. And so this morning we come and with that recognition, God, that you are so good. Lord, that you are so good. In the midst of everything that we're going through, Lord, your goodness does not change. And so, Lord, we can praise you this morning, no matter where we're at, because you are good. Lord, I don't need my life to be perfect. I don't need the circumstances of my life to all be falling into place. I come and I praise you this morning because my God is the King. My God is the Lord. My God is the Savior, the Redeemer, the ever-risen risen Lord. And I can come and praise you this morning, God, because of who you are. And the church of God said, Jesus, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone are Savior. Show the world your love.
is a table that you prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how I find my There's a table that you've prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood you shed for me This is how I fight my
year. It's only been two months. But with the word that Joe has given with Breakthrough, there's been a lot of resistance um, for myself and for a lot of people that I've talked to. And so we just need to be singing these songs over ourselves and just pursuing God that much more because when there's resistance, when there's a battle, it means that we're taking a step in the right direction. It means that we're doing something for God and that God is doing something in our lives and the devil doesn't like that. So a lot of times it may feel like God is um, far from us when we're in our battles, but I think that's when he's fighting the hardest for us. My victory is in Jesus' name. My victory is in Jesus' name. My victory is in Jesus' name. Declare this over your battle. My victory is in Jesus' name. Only His name can do this. My victory. Take what? 
Father, we just thank you today, God, that you are with us. We thank you for your presence in this place, God. Jesus. I just feel like we should pray for our kids today. If, there, if there's children around you, can you just place your hands on them? And I just want to pray for our, our kids today. There's a lot of pressure on our children. The enemy would come against their lives and say all kinds of things and, and speak all kinds of darkness and, and just curses over them. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, we break every lie of the enemy that has been spoken over our kids, Lord. God, we speak every, every curse that, 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 uh, of, of worthlessness or, or garbage or somehow not significant, God, that has been placed upon them. God, we break that in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we declare that our children are children of destiny father god that your hand is upon them lord and that you have truth and righteousness over them god lord we just declare god that you will lead them into good places father and god that you your hand of protection would be upon them so lord we ask that the angels of heaven would surround our children god lord that they be lights in the dark world god that would shine your truth and your love father and we thank you for our kids lord lord we thank you for the children's workers today lord tyler and alicia god and, and, and mitch and sherry and and, and all those those, Lord, that are involved in serving our children, God. Lord, we pray your goodness over them, your strength upon them, God. Lord, we pray that their hearts would be soft towards you and these children, God, and that the goodness of the Lord would shine upon them, Father. God, we thank you for the children of this house, God. Lord, we thank you, God, that you have brought children in, Lord. And I pray, God, that they would experience you, Lord. Lord, they would not only hear about you, God, but they would experience you, Father, God. That something of the Holy Spirit would be deposited in their heart, even a young age. God, that would transform them, Lord, that would change the way they, they view life, God, Lord, that would, would cause them to see things different from the world around them. So, Lord, we, we, we trust you, God, with our kids today, and we pray a blessing, the blessing of heaven upon them. And the church of God said, Amen. 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 So this time we'll uh, dismiss the kids and go upstairs and we're just going to uh, uh, take a few moments, grab a co cup of coffee and uh, come back for the rest of the service. As, uh, I have a lot to say this morning. <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> hopefully it's not bad. <laughs> it's snowing. Oh, it's like a blizzard out there. I don't know whose idea that was, but Uh, it's good to be in church today. I was uh, at work last Sunday, so um, thank you to Sarah for uh, holding down the fort, and Melissa, and Tony, and all the good work everyone does. Uh, I always know that things are in good shape. Without me, I'm actually kind of redundant, so um, that's the part where you guys are supposed to say, no, no, we need you. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, you are. Great. Uh, it's potluck after church, so we just invite you to stick around and uh, and uh, have uh, something to eat and uh, fellowship and all that good stuff. So right after service, we'll just grab some tables, set them up, and uh, yeah. Uh, just one other little quick announcement is uh, uh, Young Life is having a uh, dessert fundraiser night. And it's in the Bolton on, th on Thursday, February 27th. And so uh, if you uh, are into uh, Young Life and supporting youth in our community, we just encourage you to maybe partake in that. And uh, you can talk to Matt, our drummer, this morning if you have any questions. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. I'm well, too. Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> So for the last little bit, we've been, we've been focusing a lot on, on breaking free. And that's the word the Lord gave me for, this war, for, this, uh, for us this year. And, and maybe you're, you're starting to find you know, this whole talk of breaking free a, a little redundant. And, but, but the depths of, of, of Christ's freedom for our life, it, it cannot be underestimated. How God wants to move in our lives, the way he wants to bring us into deeper relationship. The desire he has to see us dream dreams and, and how he wants us to know joy, peace, and hope. Like God is really into us being free. 
He really is. And, and it's a freedom not to self-indulgence or, or simple comfort that never really fulfills and only leads to the empty pursuit of self and pleasure, but rather a freedom that strips away the insecurities and fears and the, the emptiness of sin. Free from insecurities that I'm less than or somehow not good enough. Free from the expectations of self and man. Free to be who you're created to be. Not defined by your trauma, not defined by your upbringing, not defined by your self-talk, not defined by a religious system, but free. Like free to create and, and, and free to imagine and free to love. See, the freedom of Christ, it breaks the conformity, conformity to this world. It breaks, it shatters the idea that, that I ha can find salvation in myself. It demolishes strongholds that keep me bound to the pursuit of materialism. Like freedom's like a really good thing. It's really worth investing our, our, our time into. And it's, there's a real reason why God would have us on this path. See, if freedom, it brings clarity to the fact that I am more than flesh. That, that I am a spirit being. That I have a soul. That, that I'm not meant to, that, that I am meant to have spiritual connection to God. That I have spiritual gifts that are meant to impact this world around me. See, simply put, we all need more freedom. We all need more freedom. And freedom is the conduit which the Spirit flows. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. God does not want you to be limited. He does not want you to be dreamless. He does not want you to settle. He has not created you without a purpose. He has put gifts and uniqueness in you. And his freedom is to bring you into purpose. His freedom is to release what is in you. You will never uh, really have what's in you come out unless you're free. People that are in bondage can't really express, can't really release what God has put in them. But when, the, the freer we are, the more we're able to uh, experience God and to release what God has put in us. Acts 17, 28 says, says it like this. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So we live and we move and we have our being in Christ. So that freedom, when the freedom of Christ is in us, that's the only way we really freely live. And we really truly move and have our being. The freedom in Christ is what brings us to life. And the, the need for freedom is never ending. There's no depth to the freedom of Christ. And there are points in all our lives that God wants to strip away bondage. Strip away lies. Strip away false identity. Strip away mindsets that say, I'm okay with having this in my life. We all grew up in, a, in some kind of a system. Some kind of environment. And in that, we pick things up. Some good and some bad. And, and sometimes... We don't even realize the, the bondages that we picked up in our lives. And so I really feel like this is a year where God wants to go deep into us and say, hey, no, you know, you have this attitude or this thought or this way of thinking or looking at things, and I, I want to break that because I love you. That's what freedom is. It strips away and it breaks the, the, the ceilings, the mindsets, the brokenness, the sin. Like, I, I've been a pastor for... A long time, and, I'm, I'm, and I hate to say that because it, I'm starting to, you, you get to a certain age where it's like, oh, holy, like how'd that happen? And then you're like, like I'm not young anymore, like I'm this, I used to be middle age, and I'm, now I'm thinking that's starting to get, you know, moving towards this other thing, and it's really weird. But I've been a pastor and I, for a while now, and I've, I've been a Christian even longer than that. I've been in church for, for it seems like forever, and I've seen some stuff. Some of it good, some of it strange, some of, some of it really powerful, and it's left me in awe. But I've seen some bad stuff too. Things that have shocked me, behaviors, attitudes, and, and thinkings of Christians that are so contrary to the word of God. I've seen a lot of Christians and, and even pastors, gifted individuals, anointed, called, sidetracked and just wrecked, leaving marriages, families, and, and churches ruined. 
Because of areas in their lives that have been swept under the rug of compromise or, or hurts and unforgiveness that they've, they've allowed to fester or, or limited religious thinking that have more to do with control and less to do with love. Like, it's important that we allow God to look at the different areas of our life and those, those deep places. It's important that we, that's why we need freedom so we don't end up shipwrecked. There's a reason why lives end up shipwrecked. And so God has us in this place where he's like, I want to take you through this, this season of, of breaking free so that you can experience and, and not end up in bad places. This is the why we're, we're spending so much time on this. Because it, like, freedom is such a deep work is, is the reality of it. It's a, it's a deep work. When we invite the Holy Spirit to go, work, go to work, he's going to dig deep. Because freedom is about the deep-rooted things in our lives, not just the surface stuff that God wants to deal with. And in order to be truly free, it has to be deeper than behavior modification. It has to be deeper than just starting to do the right stuff, but still underneath in your heart, there's deep-rooted issues. And this takes time. Because as I said, we aren't always fully aware of the bondages in our lives. We've gotten so used to them or we accepted them and we embrace and excuse or downplay our bondages. Understand, God wants you to be free. Luke 4, 18, 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. Like sometimes I think we, we look at people with certain issues in their life and we go, oh yeah, they need freedom. And it's so easy to see the areas where they need freedom. And I just want you to take a step back and, and take a moment and realize, no, like there's areas in my life. There's things in, that I need freedom. Like I need freedom. And the goal is freedom. And God is at work. And it's a year of breaking free. And, and so much of freedom begins in our minds. How we think, how we see God, how we see ourselves. And this is where I really want to focus this morning. The title of my message is, What You See is What You Get. What you see is what you get. Because how we see ourselves will, will often determines where we end up. Like just naturally, when you go for a walk, you look to see where you're going. The other day I was, I was trying to get out of the house and I was in a bit of a rush. And so it was, it was me and Linnea. And so I yell at Linnea, you know, hurry up, get shoes on, we got to get going. You know, and she's at that age, well, she's always been at that age, where she just likes to take her time and she gets easily sidetracked. And so I'm, I'm doing a few things while I'm waiting for her. And I'm in a rush and, and she's not coming. And so now I'm starting to get annoyed. Well, actually, I'm already annoyed. I'm like full annoyed, annoyed mode right now. And, and so I yell again, come on, you know, like, what, what are you doing? We got to get going here. And she says, I'm coming. Dad, I'm coming. But she doesn't appear. <laughs> You're no better. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so I, I, I go and, and I get her. And I walk into her, her room. And she's pretending to be blind. Like, she's walking like this, right? And she's trying to find her stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing, kid? You're killing me. <laughs> like, you know, like... Like, I got a bit of a cold, right? Like, I gave them life, and, I, and my kids, what did they give me? They gave me a cold. <laughs> but we walk towards what we see. Like, our eyes in the front of our head to look forward to, to what we're going to, not to, in the back. Because what I'm going towards is more relevant to where I've been than, than where I've been. Like, I need to see where I'm going. And where I, where I see is, is what I walk towards. And so how you see yourself is important because what you see is what you get. And when we embrace negativity about ourselves, when we accept falsehood about ourselves, that doesn't enable us to walk in freedom. Because what you see is what you get. So it's important that we see ourselves with the understanding of how God sees us. 
But so often we tend to focus on the negative about ourselves. And I'm not talking about appearance, but more in the area of our behavior or our attitude. When we allow our definition of ourselves to be determined by our failure, our brokenness, or our sin. So we stay in this perpetual mindset of neg negativity. Always seeing our, ourselves defined by the negative mindset that keeps us in bondage. This is what I see about myself. So this must be what I am. And this is the devil's game. He loves to play in our mind. Getting us to focus on negativity, failure, brokenness, hurt, loss, darkness. Wanting us to embrace the falsehood, close ourselves with, with these garments of darkness, convincing ourselves that we are trapped and we must limit our expectations of God's goodness, defining ourselves by what we see and rejecting God's view of what he says. But understand, and this is key, we need to hear and take to heart God's view of us over our own sight. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. So I have to take to heart what God says about me. I don't walk by just by what I see. I, I have to walk by faith, by faith of what God has said about me. So I have to walk towards his voice. Because I don't always see the full picture. I don't always see who God's created me to be. I don't always see what God is doing in my life. I don't always see his grace for me. I don't always see what is in me. But 1 John 4, 4 says, Little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. See, what God has put in you is greater than what you've been going through. What God has put in you is greater than your failure. What God has put in you is greater than your disappointment. What God has put in you is greater than your sin. And because of what is in you, you have the ability to overcome. You're not a failure, you're an overcomer. That's what God says. He says, you're not a disappointment, you're an overcomer. You're not defined by what you've been through, you're an overcomer. You're, you, you are not your sin, you are an overcomer. Because what is in me is what makes me an overcomer. It's not my behavior or, or, or my thinking, it's what is in me that makes me an overcomer. So when I see myself, not by, because by, I can look and I can see all the disappointing things about Joe, but when, rather when I take and say, but just a minute, what is in me is greater than the disappointing things that I see. So I don't walk by, my, by, by sight, I walk by faith, and by faith, Christ has says that he has put things in, the, in me that make me an overcomer. I feel like this is better than what you guys are reacting to. <laughs> What is in you is greater, so you're an overcomer. So you don't have to go by your own sight. You go by, rather, what he says. How he sees you. And so this morning, on some key areas, I want to give you God's view of you. I want to try and help you change the way you see yourself. Like, this is so important. Because if, if, if you can get that view off of how you see yourself, and get God's view of how he sees you, that that transforms you. That changes your thinking. That changes your perspective. That, that will change your life. Because we all have this, this self-voice and, and these negative thoughts that race through our minds. saying, oh, you're this, you're that. Or look at you, you, you failed again or, or you sinned again. See, it, it, and, we, and it justifies what we think of ourselves. But if we can come to a place where we say, but yeah, but this is what God says about me. And that truth becomes, becomes like this shield that I hold over my, over my mind or over my heart. It's transformational. So it's so important that we see how he sees. So we get what he has for us. His grace, his love, and his freedom. And the first view that, that keeps a lot of people in bondage is that they see themselves as a victim. Like, seeing yourself as a victim is, is very dangerous. When we see ourselves as a victim then we are declaring over ourselves that we'll never have victory. The de very definition of a, of a victim is one that is injured, destroyed, or sacrificed under various conditions, one that is subject to oppression, hardship, or mistreatment, one that is tricked or duped. Simply put, a victim is someone who always loses. Let me say again, there's no victory in being a victim. They don't go together. A victim is, is subject to the force of others. A victim is a pawn. 
Victims don't overcome. Victims don't rise above. Victims don't defeat giants. And we see this in the Bible in Mehebesheth, the grandson of a King Saul, who lived his life as a crippled reject in this place of desolation called Lodabar. A man who was meant to live in the palace, a man who was royalty, yet living on the charity of others, hiding away from his destiny. And when Mehebesheth is finally brought from Lodabar to the palace by King David, listen to how Mehebesheth describes himself in 2 Samuel 9. It says, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Like this guy's royalty. He's a somebody. He's the blood of kings. But he sees himself as a victim. Victim to his lameness. Victim to his failure. Victim to his past. So he describes himself as a dead dog worthless, a waste of space, disposable, no redeeming value. See, this is the thing. A victim always focuses on the negative in their life, and they give more power to the negative than the positive. They, they, they see the negative as their excuse to stay the same, to have a bad attitude, to believe for little. Victims feel and act powerless. I'm always going to be broke. I'm always going to be stuck in this cycle. Life is unfair. I never get any breaks. And so they become what they see. Never moving forward. Never pushing themselves. Seeing every pushback as proof of of their inability to overcome. Seeing every obstacle as a reason to quit. But in the story of Mehebesheth, he encounters the king. He encounters the king. And it's interesting and it's very powerful because the king doesn't see a broken lame man. King David says in 2 Samuel 9, verse 7, David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and yes, you shall eat bread at my table always. The king sees Mehebesheth as royalty, as a prince. And the king wants and promises goodness and blessing to Mehebesheth. Like Mehebesheth has lived his whole life being a victim and and living like a victim. What you see is what you get. But one encounter with a king changes everything. One glimpse of how the king sees him changes everything. And Mehebesheth goes from Lodabar, a place of isolation, a place for rejects, a place of desolation, to the palace, to the king's table. My God, isn't that what we all want? And get this, it has nothing to do with Mehebesheth. He was still lame. He still had issues. He still had struggles. But the king wasn't looking at what he didn't have or the way he was still broken. He was looking at who he was. Mehebesheth was royalty. So the king never saw a victim. Like it's so, I love it. Like he's still lame. He's still broken. So like, this is us sometimes because we, we see ourselves and we think, well, you know, I, I keep failing in this area. Or I, keep, I keep struggling in this area. So, you know, but the, but the king looks at you and says, no. Yeah. yeah, just because, like, we think we have to get to a, a we're, we're, you know, we encounter God, so now everything has to be perfect. I have somehow have to have all the things line up in my life. And if I don't, then somehow that, that, that dismisses or underplays the encounter I had with God. But that's not true. Because sometimes you still have lameness that you're working through or brokenness in your life. It doesn't downplay what God is doing or has done. It just means you're in process. You're still welcome to the king's table. You're still brought into the palace. And so you can't focus on, oh, but I still do this or I'm still struggling in this area. No, it's like I'm I'm, 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 I'm royalty. King David didn't wait for Mehebesheth all of a sudden to get strong and and become, you know, a a champion or anything like that. He's like, no, he took him in his brokenness because of what was in him. It's what's in you. It's how God sees you. You know how God sees you? 1 Peter 2.9 it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. John 15 says, God sees you as no longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends. 
For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, it doesn't say that, you know, if you're perfect, you're a new creation. It doesn't say if you have it all together, you're a new creation. It says if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Like he doesn't just see the perfect Christians this way. He sees you and me this way. And perfectly perfect. Chosen. Royal. Holy. Friend. New creation. That's how God sees you. The king sees Mehabasheth, the victor. So he calls him. But then Mehabasheth has to receive what the king has said. The onus was on him to see what the king saw. And he had to believe the promise of the king. He has to leave Lodabar in order to go live in the palace. Understand, God sees you as a victor. Not a victim. A victor. 1 John 5 says, 5, 4 says, For everyone who has been born of God has overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Romans 8, 37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He says you're more than a conqueror. You may not feel like it, but I don't really care about your feelings because the word says you're more than a conqueror. Focus on that. Psalm 60, 12 says, With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. What you see is what you get. Victim or victor. The second view that keeps a lot of people in bondage is they see themselves as a failure. And the enemy loves this one. He loves to fill our head with all the negativity of our past. All the mistakes, all the dumb decisions, all the times we failed. And, and this is because failure is, is very paralyzing. When we see ourselves as a failure, we tend to walk in the fear of failing. We don't push ourselves. We're scared to try new things. We remain stuck. We live beneath our potential. We are people of unfilled dreams because we're scared. We're scared, well, what if I try and I, I can't do it? What if I try and it doesn't come together? What if I try and I fail? So what? Everyone fails. Some of your greatest lessons are, are learned through failure. I am who I am today because I've failed it's a continuous thing. But if, we, 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 if, we, if we embrace failure, like if, we, if, we, if we're scared of failure, then we'll never move forward. And so we have to learn that failure is only the end of the story if we stop there. Failure doesn't have to define you. And people that stop at failure never see freedom. There's no freedom in failure. Like, did you know that the average amount of times a person who is seriously trying to break free from, su from substance abuse goes into re uh, recovery programs five times on average? Five times. Five times before they finally take that step. Five times of, of, of going, failing, going, failing, going, failing. Like, it doesn't, but you know what? Who cares? Who cares about... Time number one, two, three, four, and five. It, it's, it, it's about the time when they get free. It's not about the times that they fail. If it takes five times, fine. If it takes six, seven, eight times, fine. But, it, but if they get free, that's what matters. But so often in our mindset, it's like, but I'll fail. And so you don't even try. You don't even push yourself. And so you never get free. Failure or freedom. Simply put, in life, at times, you have to pick yourself up and try again. You may have failed, but at least you're still trying. You may have failed, but at least you're still believing. You may have failed, but at least you're still fighting. Like, God can work with that. He does great things with our try and our effort. But not so much with quit or, or giving up or never trying. See, one thing I, I like about Scripture is the realness of the heroes of faith. Like, Scripture has no problem showing us the warts uh, of these giants of the faith. And when, when you look at them, you see so many have failed, like big time. Yet God never saw their failure. 
God has still incorporated them in his plan. He still had a purpose for them. He, he, he using the broken pieces of, of their life to, to display his power, his might, and his greatness. People like Noah, who was a drunk, or Abraham, who was a coward and abused Hagar, or, or Moses, who was a murderer, or David, who was an adulterer, and Samson, I mean, Samson, he was just a mess. And, and, and like, these are big names of the Bible. Like, this is like a, a list of the all-stars. And then we get to Peter, the denier of Christ, who, who turned his back on his friend, abandoning Jesus. Let's look at this in, in Luke 22. Starting at verse 60, but Peter said, man, I do not know who you're talking about. And immediately while he was speaking, the, roast, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Like what a moment. In this moment, it looked like all the dreams were dead and, and Peter had failed. He's a lost and broken man in this moment. But this, we know, wasn't the end of Peter's story. And, and when we next see, but when we next see Peter, he's gone back to fishing. See, Peter thought that his failure was his end. Guess I'll go back fishing. Guess I'll settle. Guess I'll give up. It didn't work out. I, I couldn't do it. I wasn't failed. I, I failed. I wasn't good enough. I, could, I couldn't do it. The song of, of failure was what he was singing. And that's not a good song. Icky Breaky Heart is a better song than that. <laughs> but then something spectacular happens. Jesus shows up. John 21 verse 15 says, When they had finished their breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend to my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know everything, God, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. In this moment, Jesus reaffirms Peter's calling. He tells Peter, you're not done. Your failure will not define you. And Jesus looks and he sees Peter as free. Free from his failure, free from his guilt, free from his shame. He saw Peter the rock. So Peter has to once again pick up his calling. See, Jesus is saying, Peter, you're not allowed to use your failure as, as an excuse to quit. Like, you can focus on your failure. You can see all the reasons why you can't. But God sees his freedom, not failure in our lives. John 8, 3, 6 says, So if the Son set you free, you'll be free indeed. What you see is what you get, failure or free. Failure or freedom. The third view that keeps us, a lot of us in bondage is that we see ourselves as a sinner. Now let me say, yes, we are all sinners. We've all sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Acts 3.19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. None of us is without sin. Sometimes I think my wife is. But not me. We were very clear on that. None of us is without sin. And we all need a Savior. And it, it's our sin that separates us from God. It's our sin that robs us. It's our sin that brings brokenness into the world. And it's our sin that God wants to save us from. Sin is the reason that Jesus died on the cross. But understand, when you become a Christian, your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. Your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. Your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. See, the, the blood of Jesus transfers me from a sinner to a son. John 1, 12 says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Galatians 4, 4, 5 says, but when this time had, had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. 
It's so easy to see ourselves as sinners because we all sin, but we have to understand sonship trumps behavior. Me as a son trumps my behavior. Like my daughters are my daughters. They're my kids. Not based on their behavior. Not because they always do the right thing. Not because they never anger or annoy me. It's not a behavior thing. It's a blood thing. They got my blood. Like blood trumps all. They're part of me. So I don't see them as their behavior. I see them as my daughters. Like that's a big distinction. That is good, Melissa. Thank you. And we, we all know the story of the prodigal son who, who, has, who, 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 who takes advantage of the father's love and generosity. His, his grace, so to speak. Like there's so much of, you know, the imagery here. The father, you know, God, us, the prodigal son, right? We take advantage of God's grace sometimes. We take advantage of his love for us. And this is what the prodigal son does. And he runs off and he, he ruins his life in, the, in wicked living. And then when he comes to a crisis... Often like us, he decides to humble himself and go to the Father. Luke 15, starting verse 20, says, He got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy, he says, no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate it. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. The story so clearly illustrates my point. The son had totally rejected the father, taken advantage of the father, spent what the father had worked hard for his whole life in total disregard of the father. Totally just disregard for everything the father had given him and, and done for him. Like I can, I so relate to this because this is me at times, in all honesty. Where I disregard what God has done for me and I go after my own thing. I, I, I you know, I, I, I take advantage of his grace and, and run after what fulfills me. But the son comes to this place of repentance and all he sees is himself as a sinner. He thinks this is who he is and that he has no right to sonship any longer. Somehow his, his sin is too great now. His, his, his disregard for, for his father is too powerful. Somehow he has lost the right to sonship. This is the broken thinking of the prodigal son. This is our broken thinking at times where we think, Mom, it's, I've done too much. I've gone too far. I've taken too much advantage of God. So I, I can't somehow come back as a son. But maybe I can just slip back in, in the back of the pews and, 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 and serve a little bit or, or somehow just find a place where God won't notice me, but I can still be near him. Like we, we get to this place where we think, well, maybe I can just get near him, but we can't actually get close to him because my son, sin is too bad. It's separating me too much from the father. But the father says, no, once you're my son, you're my son. And there's no second class citizens in my family. There's no second place sons in my family. And so he, he, even though he comes and says, I, I just let me be a servant, the father sees him a far ways off and he's like, my son, my son. All he see, sees is the sonship. He doesn't see the behavior. He doesn't see the brokenness. He doesn't see all the terrible things he's done. He sees a son. He sees you. He sees you, his son, his daughter. But the son, he thinks that his behavior determines his worth. That now all he was is second class. That he could never be a person of authority, never a person of inheritance, never a person of calling or purpose. Like seeing yourself as a sinner causes you to limit your potential, causes you to doubt your authority, causes you to believe for less. That's why it's so, it's just wrong thinking. Like, you notice that what he does, he, he says, put the best robe on him, put, put the ring on him, put the sandals on him. Like, these are signs of acceptance and sonship and authority. Like, the, 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 the servants don't go around wearing the robes and the, and the rings and the sandals. It's the sons. All the father sees is his son. And all he wants to do is bless him. 
But understand, blessing is for sons alone. And you'll never walk in blessing of the Father without seeing yourself as a son. Like the son had to receive the robe, the sandals, and the ring. He had to take on his sonship. Yes, you have to repent, but you, but you, can't, you can't just accept and live with your sin. But God sees you not as a sinner, but as a son. What you see is what you get. Like this is really important because so often in our lives we look at ourselves and we, we see our sin and we think, no, oh, man, like God, I'm too bad. Or God, I keep failing this area. And the enemy loves to play in that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. See, you're not really, you're just a hypocrite. You're just playing this game. You, don't, you aren't really. And we buy into that. And what does that do? That's distanced us from the place where we need to be. That distanced us from the Father. Man, I'm too dirty. I'm too broken. And it, it causes us to distance instead of coming to him where, where, that, where we find our healing. What you see is what you get. Don't believe the lie that your behavior determines God's view of you. You are his child first. Blood triumphs behavior. Sinner or son. I'm going to finish there because I feel like that's good. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Lord, I just pray, God, this morning, God, in all our lives, that you would change our view of ourselves, God. Lord, that we would start to see ourselves the way that you see us. Lord, that there would just be a shift in our focus, God, off of ourselves, Lord, and onto you. Lord, you call us your children. You call us your sons and daughters, Lord. Lord, you call us forgiven. Lord, you call us redeemed. You call us worthy. And I pray, God, that that truth, Lord, that we would live by that faith of what you've said, Lord, not by the sight of what we see so often in ourselves. I pray, God, there would be a shift in each one of us, Lord. Lord, that the truth of your word would sink deep into, your heart, into our hearts. Father, we thank you this day. Lord, you are tremendous. You are good. You are love. And we are blessed to be all your children. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.